And now, uh, that's another highlight of the, uh, of the plenary session. So, we, had, we started with a medical doctor, and then we started uh, in Nobel Laureate in Medicine. We, we continue with Dan Shetman, Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, speaking about entrepreneurship. And here we have Dr. Hariko Inufusa, which is a researcher, uh, but also an entrepreneur. And now, uh, what, is the, what is the baseline of all this? The baseline of all this, if I can call the baseline, are materials, 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 materials. So, uh, I always um, mentioned uh, in in uh, Twitter, are you are you uh, fed up with ma with standard materials? So s somebody furnish you standard materials that they have to deal with it and they have to adapt to their properties. So here, we have a different, completely different view. If you are fed up with standard materials, now it is materials uh, on demand. Materials, you can create your own materials by managing the composition and structure, and, uh, and even electronic structure. So materials on custom tailored materials, if I can say so. So I'm trying to simplify all this, but here Professor Novoselov will speak about this. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, morning everybody, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. And so I'll try to talk today about materials uh, for, the, for the future, but since I promised Lauren that I will speak a bit about, uh, about graphene, so I will just let me start, and especially it's a very convenient starting point when talking about uh, future materials and, and, and materials uh, on demand. And uh, so graphene, two-dimensional material, very, very simple, only carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb lattice on, on a plane. Uh, just you, you cannot find anything simpler than, than that, and yet it has a number of superlatives which really uh, give us not only very exciting science, but also uh, promise for many, uh, for many possible applications ranging from energy to composites to uh, optoelectronics to, to, uh, to sensors to, uh, to high frequency electronics. And, but then I would really like to echo um, uh, Dan's lecture in the morning, which really says that you need to learn the, the rules of business, and I was really, I was really surprised myself when uh, seeing that. Okay, we have laws of physics. Apparently, there are laws of uh, of uh, uh, of economy as well, and they actually do work. Because gr graphene for us it was a very special material, but then it when it came to applications, it followed exactly the footsteps of many other uh, advanced materials before it, like uh, carbon fibers, carbon nanotubes. So they, the first applications, they, they usually come in, in composites, with the, uh, usually in sports goods where you can pay premium for very moderate improvement of the, of the properties. Our cells, we collaborated with uh, uh, McLaren and Richard Miller to create this world lightest, unfortunately also world most expensive watch uh, one million Swiss franc for 32 grams, definitely by far most expensive per gram. Which, uh, so if you haven't got one million Swiss, you can spend a quarter of a million on this, uh, on this uh, car. And the, so it's a small manufacturer nearby Liverpool, but these days they, uh, all of their cars are actually produced with the use of, uh, with the use of graphene panels. And the, and the reason for that is not that uh, it, it gives you better strengths or, or uh, smaller weight, but it's actually the speed of production because of the thermal conductivity of, of graphene. But then it just really went, went viral, and then these days you get uh, every single Ford car would have some graphene under its bonnet, uh, bonnet. Again, for some interesting application, is the noise cancellation. From the, from the hindsight, you would probably could guess that having a lot of 2D interfaces would give you a good scattering of the phonons, but uh, so they, it took uh, Ford engineers several years to develop this. And then 
uh, of course, electronics for thermal management. Um, like most of the Huawei models would use graphene for, uh, for thermal dissipation. Graphene is the, uh, has the, the highest thermal conductivity uh, 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 factor. And then, um, so an interesting one, so it's the, um, it's the use of, of graphene for, uh, for resistance standard. You know that to calibrate all our electronics, we need the standard of, of current and the standard of resistance. So the resistance standard is done through the measurement of the quantum Hall effect. It's Klaus von Klitzing, uh, Nobel Prize in 85. So he, he, he spoke previously on this, on, the, on this conference. And these days, all of those measurements are done with, uh, with graphene. It's either in, uh, in NIST or in, uh, in, in physics lab in, in Teddington or or, or in PTB or, or in France. So, um, and then, uh, so these days I would say if I need to search for the most uh, advanced uh, application, I would say it would be for silicon photonics for, for uh, telecommunication where we need, because uh, most of the, tele of the telecommunication these days is of course through the optical fibers, but then uh, if we need to do something with the signal to modulate it, to, uh, to, uh, to just dissect it into different packages and send to different users, we have to do it in the electronic domain. So every time we have to convert from optics to electronics, and it takes time, so it would be much, much better if we could do everything on the, on the optical domain only, and, uh, and the only possible solution at this moment of time uh, is the graphene plus other 2D material um, photodetectors, modulators, and, uh, and, and light emitters in, in, uh, in uh, combination with silicon photonic waveguides. And then just maybe just mention one more, uh, one more uh, interesting application where Graphene is, is being used as the thinnest possible membrane, which is generally uh, in, uh, impermeable for any, any atoms or, uh, or molecules or any other species. But then we can modify it and we can, uh, we can make it permeable for some, some uh, specific ions. Basically, we're approaching the functionality of the, of the biological membranes where we can selectively filter for, uh, for particular ions. So of course, for some time, there was a question whether we can produce enough uh, graphene, because we started a long time ago with the uh, uh, so-called uh, macromechanical cleavage. You basically use scotch tape and use the fact that graphite is a lead material and just peel off your, your, uh, your monolayers of, of graphene. Very reliable, but of course not very uh, uh, not not suitable for, for for the mass production. Though these days, depending on the price you want to pay and the quality you want to achieve, there are many other ways how to produce graphene. So there is one which is um, uh, chemical vapor deposition, where you run carbon-containing species on top of the of a surface of a hot metal. Carbon, uh, so those species, they crack on the surface uh, due to catalytic activity. Carbon rearranges itself into, uh, into, into graphene. Hydrogen flies away. So, and the beauty of this, of this method is that, uh, that you can use pretty much anything, any carbon-containing species for, uh, for graphene production. Like, for example, we, we, some time ago, we needed to produce um, graphene doped with iron. So you just take this, just prick your finger, put your blood on, on, the, on, on, on copper, stick it into, the, into, into, into CVD furnace, and you get your graphene doped with iron. And I should say that um, no students were hurt during this experiment, so the, the fingers are mine, the blood is mine, so just everything, everything is uh, fine, at least in, in, the, um, uh, in, uh, so, so in terms of the uh, student safety. But it, but it actually brings quite an interesting opportunity here because I'm sure that many of you have seen those those uh, those uh, those pictures where um, the huge flares are, are burned above many of the refinery plants. So 
what those flares got. They got methane and they've got heat. And that's all we need to produce graphene and to produce some, some, some other materials as well. And, uh, and those, uh, and those uh, you, you basically can turn it into, um, into uh, uh, a, a furnace and you put it on top of that, those of those of those chimneys, and that's exactly what we do. We create reactors which turn those that waste gas and the waste heat into the useful carbon nanomaterials. So this is the first generation of this setup. It produces graphene. We have the next one which produces carbon nanotubes. And more important, so for us, it's of course, the value is that we we, we make up uh, the useful nanomaterials. For but then for the, for say uh, those oil. Uh, oil companies, they, they can gain carbon credits, which we can, the same machine can register on the, on the blockchain immediately, and that, and that actually works, uh, works quite well. So now uh, I just, just will say that there are many other ways how to, how to produce graphene, but, but the most important um, impact uh, of, of graphene was the discovery of many other two-dimensional crystals. So if you say, uh, you can make graphene from lead pencils. What if you have other pencils? Can you make other materials? The answer is yes, you can. So there are, in fact, many other two-dimensional crystals. They're all only one atom thick, but yet they have many different properties from the most insulating to the most conductive, superconductors, semiconductors, semi-metals, ferromagnets, ferroelectrics, you name it. So now we have a huge variety of those two-dimensional crystals, and it's really exciting to study all of them. But that, that really gives us a new opportunity in terms of m material engineering, because what now we can do if we have layers, I pr pretty much perfect layers of those two-dimensional crystals, we can start putting them together uh, in, a, in a stack, in a three-dimensional uh, material, uh, but in such which never existed in nature. So we can create with atomic precision anything, any, uh, any material on demand. And that's what we call the, uh, the uh, new direction in the, in, in the field of material science, tailored materials or on demand materials. So we can encode any properties or any functionality with the atomic precision inside of those, of, of those, of those crystals. And of course, so and uh, quite a few of those uh, devices have been made. So we, we make new uh, novel type of transistors, photo detectors, solar cells, light emitting de devices. So it really takes a lot of. Um, it's quite a quite a job to put layer by layer, one atom by by one atom those layers. But in fact, you can really encode very very interesting properties. And that's actually what we. That's uh, the. Uh, I think how the, the modern uh, material science works. We switch from the given materials like silicon or steel for construction or aluminium for, for, uh, for uh, uh, airspace industry. We switch to tailored materials, so materials which we can design on demand for, uh, for uh, specific applications. So you, you, you want a particular wavelength of emission, you just get, you, you get it from the, um, you just design the stack for which, which you need. But that actually, so that's the state of the art now, but let's now just get to the actual point of my, of my talk, materials for the future. So what, what, what do we want in, in future from our materials? So let me just show you this little clip. I'm sure that many of, uh, of, of, of us in the audience would, would remember this, this movie. It's, uh, it's Terminator 2, right? So the, the plot is that the robot from the future is sent back to 1991 when the movie was shot to kill Sarah Connor and, and her son. Uh, I'm not going to, to just um, tell you through all the movie. The only reason I'm, I'm showing it to you is just... And the, and the movie, the, the, the time of the robot was set at 2029 in the movie. So, and the only reason I, I'm showing it to you is to demonstrate what was the dream of, the, of us, of, uh, of the directors of the movies, about robots of the future. So they, they should be made of 
liquid metal, be agile, change in shape, should be just uh, self-healing, self-replicating maybe now. So we are now in uh, 2022 and I have bad news for you that uh, I don't think we have a any chance to actually fulfill that dream of those, um, of those directors. And it's not only about actually how good is our programming or how good is our, is our um, uh, individual components and how well do those robots move. It's just fundamentally our technology is not suitable to produce those. So what I mean by that is that our technology uh, follows the so-called top-down functionality. It means that individual components in our systems are not functional. The, only, the, the functionality comes only when you put those components together on a system level. So you take one piece and it doesn't work at all, completely. So you just really, it's, uh, so you, you, you really need the system to be perfect and to, to be assembled uh, entirely together. Now, and it's, it's not only about robotics or clock, or clock making, it's about electronics, it's about energy, it's just really about everything. So that's how our technology works. Now, let's look into, if you look into biological systems, they operate on a, on a completely different pretense. So there, the functionality is distributed across all the possible levels. Like individual proteins, they're functional in their own rights. You don't think that, okay, this protein needs to unfold, do this catalytic reaction, then fold back and then store it somewhere. It is done by itself. And then same on the, on the membrane, same on the organ level, on the cellular level, and so on. So the question is, can we actually try to produce materials which, which can take on themselves some uh, functionality, which we usually do on the, on the system level. Just uh, let me give you one example. So we produce quite successfully graphene membranes for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for water desalination. So uh, it works well, but I mean, there are many other those membranes these days, so they, and they all work fantastically well. But then, uh, say, uh, in Israel, where Dan is from, or I, I just came from Singapore, 100% uh, of our water is produced through the desalination. But then, after this membrane, you still need to, put, to control the quality of water. You, you put a sensor, the sensor sends a signal to a computer, computer analyzes the data, sends a signal to the actuator, which opens or closes the valve, depending on the quality of, of water in, this, in the stream. But imagine we can give this function to the membrane, to the desalination membrane itself. We put some signaling molecules there, which, which sense the, the presence of some uh, toxic species, and if there, are, if there is something funny in the water, it just changes the conformation and closes the pores. So the membrane itself, the material itself, acts as a sensor, as a computer, and as an actuator at the same time. So th this is the example of the so-called functional intelligent materials by mean functional means that we can program them to perform a specific response to a quite complex response to external stimuli. And intelligent, we just use the most simple uh, definition of intelligence that at least we, we should have memory. So we need to be able to learn, the, to, sorry, to teach this material. The material should be able to learn uh, how to behave in a particular situation. So I'll, I'll talk about this, this, this uh, example later. So that's uh, like on the level of idea, it, it's great. The problem is that the moment you try to make functional and intelligent material, material with, with a memory, it means that it has to be out of equilibrium. So memory is really out of, uh, out of, uh, out of equilibrium systems. So you need to be able to remember and to forget and remember something something new uh, something new new again and physics unfortunately is very very bad at, at, at treating the out of equilibrium phenomena so that they exist but in nature but we in, in physics we just we don't have the methodology we don't have the tools how to uh, how to describe those those uh, those out of equilibrium systems so generally I mean life is out of equilibrium and uh, unfortunately, we don't have any, any ways how to 
describe it, so there are no equations, unfortunately. So what we're trying to do is basically ask a question, how close to uh, 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 can we approach the creation of life if we start from the, the uh, non-biological components? And uh, so, as I said, it's, uh, it's a bit of a, so we don't have any recipes, but we have some ideas on which principles it has to be done. So it, it has to be complex system with the strong interaction between components, and those, those, that interaction needs to be degenerate. It means that uh, the, the mu multiple uh, uh, channels of interaction need to compete, and then you should be able to produce the so-called degenerate energy landscape, when you have several uh, possible states, and then you can turn the system into a metastable state, and it falls into a stable and then metastable again. So it's not a particularly new idea. That's our proteins in our body. They actually work exactly in this way. So, um, so of course, uh, the, those proteins, they can be uh, found in many different conformations. They can be folded in many different ways with very close, uh, close uh, uh, energy levels. And that's exactly what gives us this uh, functionality and, and versatility because you can fold and unfold and fold again and you get a new, a new functionality, new catalytic properties of the proteins uh, every time. So for us, so, uh, you probably know that um, uh, AlphaFold has solved the ground level of those, of those proteins three years ago, which is a huge, absolutely massive achievement. What we really need to do now is to figure out all the other metastable states and the way how can we manage transitions between them. And we're trying to create artificial systems which do exactly, uh, uh, exactly the same. So, I won't go into much into methodology, so in our lab, so we use a number of low dimensional materials. We, we, we like to work with low dimensional materials if you take, if you take, because if you take uh, three dimensional, just bulk materials, they only interact at the interface, and we really need strong interaction, so we want low dimensional materials, and then we just mix them in a way, combine them in a way that, that uh, we can program a specific uh, response for a particular stimuli, but also to ensure the, the, uh, the memory function, we need to have a sort of a feedback loop which changes the, uh, the, the structure, internal structure of the material which acts as a, uh, as a memory cell. So, and then if we do this, we just, we can get into many, uh, many different applications say, uh, in, in electronics, it would be neuromorphic computers and then smart membranes, some artificial organs, and so on. So, as I said, unfortunately, our traditional physical formalism doesn't really help much, because, okay, Schrodinger equation give you the ground level, or DFT give you the ground level, and we actually need metastable states. We need to describe the, the, those, those transitions, and that's where we, we try to use um, machine learning and especially dynamic machine learning. And, and of course, to, to do that, you have to generate a lot of data. So we have to, uh, so we, we generate those data from the material robotics lab where we synthesize a lot of, a lot of those, those materials and test them under various conditions and then just plug those data into the, in, into the dynamic machine learning. And then it works, it works, it works quite well. So I showed you these uh, light emission devices already. And then there are many of, because we have many materials, we, there are many of them. But in fact, um, well, still not many enough. So we still would, would like to, to, to create a material which just sits somewhere in between, which emits, so not red, not, not, not blue, but some, uh, uh, some turquoise color. Or, uh, and then how do, how do we do it? Unfortunately, it's really, it's a bit difficult, but we try to mix those materials together. We create alloys, and, uh, and those alloys, so we, they, they, they do emit at uh, other parts of the spectrum. You can actually use those alloys for other applications like, like catalysis. And then they also, through, um, through the creation of those alloys, we create quantum dots for, 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 for quantum telecommunication. But then uh, it just 
designing those alloys and designing individual defects, it's an extremely difficult task. And the only way we can do it is to uh, use, use the machine learning. So we create libraries of those defects and then just if you have enough defect, you will get an, an, an alloy at the end. We have to pump, we have to plug in quantum descriptors into it. But then if you do things properly, then you get proper description of the, of, uh, so your AI system can predict you the properties of the alloy and the properties of the single photon emitters quantum, quantum dot suitable, for, for example, for quantum tele telecommunication. So that's one of the targets which, uh, we, which, we, which we are targeting. So this is the example of the classical AI, just really uh, very usual AI, which, which is being used for, for, for material discovery. But really, we would like to learn about the dynamic properties. And that's the, so one of the classical problem is exactly the fold, uh, folding of proteins or folding of the polymer chains. And here we just, um, we designed sort of through the uh, efforts of uh, a colleague of mine, a mathematician Li Chinxiao, the dynamic algorithms of you know, the dynamic uh, uh, so-called so uh, Ansaga net, which, uh, which learns the dynamic properties of those, of those materials, so of the folding and unfolding. And then by learning through this, it, it creates, it, it doesn't only allow us to predict the behavior, so it works really well on prediction. More importantly, it, it gives us the effective potential of the, of, of the, of the, um, uh, of the, of those proteins, so the effective potential they live in, so then we not only can predict the, their behavior, we can control their behavior, and that's really the, the, most, the most important part for, this, for those dynamic systems. So why do we need this? Just uh, let, let me give you just for in the past, in the last two minutes of my, of my talk, let me give you just a couple of examples of those dynamic systems where it's really becoming so we, which, which become more and more important for, for applications, but, but, uh, but which, which would require such machine learning tools to, uh, to, to, to be implemented to learn their behavior. So one example is this, um, it's, the, um, it's the material called a high entropy alloy. So there are many high entropy alloys, so it, it's just one of them, and it was optimized to enhance the self-healing properties. So, so what you see, this grid, is, is the individual atoms, and then we just drill a hole in it. And then if you give a little bit of energy to, to, to this material, then this hole will start to, to, to shrink until it completely disappears. So it's a self-healing self material, and so it's just not the terminator yet, but it's, uh, it, 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 goes, it, goes, it goes that way, and it's basically because we pump this out of equilibrium metastable state which, where we store all the entropy part into the, into the entropy which, which, which covers this, this, this hole uh, entirely. So another example is, well, slightly different but also complex, uh, complex system is the, uh, uh, is, is the uh, fuel cell, is the, bi is the biological fuel cell. Is, there are basically those bacteria which can emit electron during the uh, metabolism, and then we can, if you're smart, you can collect this electron and put it into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, into the external uh, circuit. And this electron you, 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 you collect, so there are several ways how you do it. Graphene sponges, so graphene electrode is one. Uh, so this one is uh, from uh, a colleague of mine Guy Bazan, he's a polymer chemist, so he, he uses the uh, conductive polymers, and those polymers are uh, created in situ from monomers. So you basically have a, a symbiotic system between the bacteria, which emit electron, help to polymerize the conductive chain, and this conductive uh, polymer chain helps the bacteria to grow. So you basically put one bacteria plenty of monomers, give it sugar or lactose in this, in, in this case, and then your battery grows, grows by itself. But of course, it's very out of equilibrium system, and the only way how we, we can, uh, uh, we can um, um, create the 
appropriate description of it would be through the, through the dynamic machine learning. So I think I will, I will stop here just to say that, um, that I showed you that uh, these days we work on the, on the uh, designer tailored materials, materials on demand. But in the future, those materials on demand need to, to become dynamic in order to, 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 to mimic some biological functions which we already have in our, in our body. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, uh, you saw, we are toward the road of making our own materials. Mm. On demand, if we like them, we can change them. It's not as easy as that, but uh, we, you know, this is the big picture, correct? Mm. So, and here we have a Nobel laureate in physics that has tripled his amount of work after getting the Nobel laureate. And, uh, that's correct? Right. Triple, yeah. four times. So sometimes when I get a Nobel, a Nobel Prize, you know, uh, you, you, you uh, slow down or you, but uh, Constantine tripled the work and he, he actually, this is a new field. The Nobel laureate was on, uh, on uh, graphene and here we have a completely different field. So sure they are related, but this is uh, impressive. Thanks a lot again. Right, thank you. I appreciate it. Pleasure.